And as we are doing, let me invite you into this 2022 sermon series as a church. Um, this is going to be a time for us to really lean forward into the work that God is calling us to in meaningful ways. This week, we're going to launch into a new sermon series titled Re, and we'll talk about that more in just a second. And one of the things that I'm most excited about already is what's happening next week. And so uh, I think today's going to be cool, but I think next week is going to be special. And next week, we're going to lean into uh, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as the country prepares to celebrate Dr. King Day on that following Monday. And for us as a church, it is intrinsic in our DNA to honor the life legacy, uh, justice of Jesus that was lived out by that man in such a pastoral and prophetic way. We're going to have a pet panel of leaders, uh, myself and Pastora Inez, our dear sister Sandy, who is with us, and then our dear brother John Williams. And so you'll hear male, female, black and Asian American and brown and white, all of us leaning into the, the justice of Jesus that we see God is still calling us to, the places that are broken, that we can truth tell and name honestly, and the places of hope and rebuilding that we believe we are still called to do. So it would be a great opportunity for you to invite someone into the space of this church. I love that when we get to lean into work like that, that it's not like we're taking a detour. It's not like we as a church are taking a tangent and we're going, oh, this is just a token Sunday. Let's just talk about race on this Sunday. Uh, but instead, if you've been a part of this church, you know that this work is intrinsic to the work that we do year round. Um, we're not just celebrating one day. We're not just honoring one month. This is work that God has called us to from the beginning. And so I invite you into that to join us next Sunday for that. Today, we're going to launch into this idea of deconstruction and reconstruction. This is a conversation that we have been a part of for years at this point, and it is a conversation that I believe is integral to people's faith stories and faith journeys. No matter how healthy your childhood discipleship may have been, no matter how absent that may have been, there is a time in our life where we have to look at our own faith journey, our own story, and begin to realize and recognize what are the things that we picked up along the way that have been no good and no helpful, and in fact have been hurtful and harmful. What are the things that we've picked up along the way that actually we need to hold on to that are good and true and right and helpful? And I don't believe we can figure out those things just all on our own. I believe we actually need the context of community. We need the health of familia to walk with us along the way in that journey to heal, to grow. Sometimes in seminary classrooms, you'd look to your left or you'd look to your right. And there was that guy who was trying to teach the professor the class instead of learning from the professor as a student in the class. And if you've been in any sort of education, higher education, you know what I'm talking about. There's the one who is always trying to bring something. And then you realize really what they're just trying to do is tear down. Some people get so enamored by deconstruction that they forget to reconstruct anything helpful. That's not where we want to land as a church. But some people are so afraid and fear-mongering of deconstruction that they demonize it. And they say that no person should deconstruct anything ever and to do anything else is to have some sort of agenda that is trying to push away, push away from Jesus. And that's, that, that's not what we're after either. We believe the work is to rebuild. We believe the work is to renew. But we're also not afraid to get out the sledgehammer and to do some demo work to tear down some of the walls that are no longer helpful for the foundation of the open, spacious place that we believe God is calling us to build. And so we invite you into that work with us. We're, we're calling it the work of re, recreating, restoring, rebuilding, renewing, reimagining, reinventing, reviving, redeeming, remembering, reconstructing, resurrecting, and then fill in the blank along the way. So we invite you today to find yourself in that story of re. Today, we will focus on that word, remembering. That idea of remembering. And I fear that one of the casualties and consequences of deconstructing is forgetting who we truly were before all the brokenness happened along the way. We've had to survive and fight our way through. And in so doing, we felt like we had to leave some part of ourself behind. That might be in some 
church or institution that might be in some family system that might be in the face of some tragedy that you experienced along the way. But every now and then, it's as if God remembers for you that which was dismembered along the way. And as God remembers, God puts something back together that even in your own memory has fallen apart from what was really taking place there. When I look back at my own childhood, I was a kid who moved around to a lot of different schools. And so I was always the new kid at school. And so I was always trying to have to make new friends and trying to find my way in a new setting. And I coped with that in a lot of different ways. And in my memory, I was off on the sideline. In my memory, I was this introverted, shy kid who was afraid to jump into the mix and do all the things that all the other kids were doing. And in fact, just a, just a quick side note, that shyness still gets me in trouble today. Uh, maybe some of the shy, introverted folks in the room can relate, but that shyness is often confused for arrogance or standoffishness or, oh, you think you're better than everybody. No, it's actually, I'm just a little shy. And as a pastor, sometimes that is very inconvenient. Um, but we have to push through and fight our way through the shyness and let people know, no, 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 I'm not trying to be too cool. I'm just still a little shy. <laughs> and that is still present in my life today. A few months ago, I was going through some old photos. And one of these photos surprised me. It caught me off guard. I didn't find what I was expecting to find. I see this little boy in the center of a room with his hand outstretched and this confident smile across his face. Now let's just ignore the clothing and the hair for just a second. Uh, the clothing looks like I'm about to sell you a box of King James Bibles on your doorstep. Uh, or maybe I've got like a great deal on a used Chevy Silverado out back and I just wanna show it to you real quick. Um, the hair looks like something out of Legoland or Ron Burgundy inspired. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, somebody gave this kid a Sunday to preach in a rural Baptist church. There's just a lot going on with the whole outfit. Um, but what caught me off guard was the smile, the eyes, the open hand, the invitation, the center of the room, a microphone. What? I don't even know what this is. I don't even know what event was happening here. I don't even have this in my collective conscious memory of, of what was actually taking place in this moment. I was obviously told to speak and say something, and I obviously enjoyed it, and it obviously doesn't fit in that narrative I have of my childhood where I was just off on the sideline. I was obviously in the mix of something, and not just in the mix, but I was inviting others into the mix of it as well. I, I think I'm telling this girl, hey, one day, years down the road, I'm going to help plant this multi-ethnic shared leadership, male, female church. You want to be a part of that? Your loss, apparently. I guess I'll have to find somebody else along the way. Uh, so, Lord, thank you for sending Pastora Inez into my life. This, this poor girl, she missed a great opportunity. This memory of this photo, though, it's as if God was remembering and reminding. Look at the light in your eyes. Look at the life. Look at the joy. Look how I placed you into a place where your voice would matter. Look how you extended your hand and invited other people not to just stay on the sideline, but to join into the mix and to story tell as well. We have a God who's good like that. And perhaps this week there's an adventure for you to look through some old photos and to invite God to remember for you, to remember that which was dismembered along the way. We're going to start and look in the book of Genesis this morning. And this story is a story of remembering that which was dismembered along the way because of our own brokenness. The deconstruction taking place here, the early chapters of Genesis, is a deconstruction that really leans back into our own waywardness, where we were trying to be like God or where we were falling into the depths of our depravity along the way. And I hope that this framework of Genesis brings back language that we can lean into for the next several weeks and months that we lean into this work of deconstruction and reconstruction, of uncreation and recreation. And today may be a little bit more teachy than preachy, but I, but I hope it's like vegetables that have been seasoned well, like olive oil and some salt and pepper and garlic powder and a, a squeeze of lemon and just roasted those things. I'm already anticipating lunch. 
Um, so I, I hope that I hope that this serving of vegetables serves us well along the way. We're going to look over the view of Genesis 1 through 12 in a brief fly by helicopter view. And I hope that the foundation that we find here serves us as a church. So this is a narrative arc of what's taking place in Genesis 1 through 11. And as you can see in the early stages of what's taking place is that there is a, a standard account of creation, fall, flood, and nations. The creation of humanity in Genesis 1 through 2. The fall of humanity with Adam and Eve and the garden and the serpent and Cain and Abel and what follows and then the filling of the brokenness that takes place after that. The flood of Genesis 6 through 9 and then this movement of nations expanding, but not in a revelation at the end of the book kind of nations where they're all coming together to worship together. But no, this is where the nations are actually coming together to try to be their own God apart from God. And so this growth of people together is not a, a growth of goodness, but in fact is a growth of brokenness along the way. And so the movement that we see here, creation, fall, flood, and nations, is just one narrative arc in the story. But you can do a more detailed account, which is what we're going to do. The detailed account will lead us as we look from Genesis 1 through 6. We'll pause there in the middle for just a moment. And then from there, we'll go more clearly into what God is doing along the way. So more than diving into one specific passage, we're going to be hanging out in this overview of what's taking place in the story. So Genesis 1, 6 through 8. The beginning is the story of creation. God is creating humanity along the way. And as God is creating, then God is commissioning. Not only do I create you, but I empower you. And I love that if you go to the beginning of the story in chapter 1, if you really look at what God is doing there in 1, 28 through 30, where it says that God created humankind in his image, in God's image, we created them, and the us-ness God created, God created community in the midst of that. And then God created the heartbeat of heaven to pass on to humanity. Everything that I have, I give on to you. No, go be an expression of me to the ends of the earth. So God commissions and empowers. And then immediately after, there is a fall. The fall of Adam and Eve and the serpent in the garden. Pastora Inez will lean into that Genesis 3 pivotal chapter for us in a couple of weeks. Because we believe that just as much as the identity work that we did in Genesis 1 and 2 is an integral, we did that in the fall, and we just landed there for a while with Ezra Konegdo and the spirit moving and woman and man all serving together. We believe that the story's turn in Genesis 3 is worthy of redemption as well, because that story has been told so wrong for so long. Then there's the story of filling. And the filling here is the filling of humanity, and it's like a poison that spreads. So the filling is not a beautiful goodness of a family tree, of a family life. You see the genealogy in chapter 5, and it's, it's not the kind of story that gives you hope because we know that the poison is spreading, the poison of Cain and Abel, the poison of the serpent in the garden. And it culminates in Genesis 6, where God looks at God's own creation and it's if God can say, this is not how I dreamed this to be. This is not how this was supposed to go. This is filled with so much brokenness that there must be another way. And so the culmination of sin and the spread of that poison is when God says, I will now create a flood so that this will no longer continue to spread in this way, but I'm gonna set one seed aside to grow in a healthier environment, and I'm gonna to have to transplant that seed somewhere else, so that in the midst of all of this poison, a good tree will grow. Reminds me of God taking Jesus and putting Jesus into the ground as a good seed that would grow, and through that good seed growing resurrection for us. And in that, we have a story of hope. Hope is not the loudest word in the story. But hope is always the last word. Hope may not be the loudest word in your story. But hope always gets the last word. And so even as we see this narrative overview of these first six chapters of Genesis, the hope is that God has his eyes on Noah. 
and God shows favor to Noah, and God stops the cycle of generational sin and says, I'm going to write a new story. It doesn't have to stay this way. And so as you look at your own story, as you look at the own narrative that you have in your life, God will write a new story. It doesn't have to stay this way. Now, if this was a, a broad overview of what takes place in those first six chapters, now we can zoom in more clearly into what takes place in that seventh chapter. It's a story of uncreating. If creation was the original story, this is the story of uncreation. Genesis 1, that Pastora Inez led us to at the very beginning of our time in Genesis, of that spirit hovering over the water, the ruach that was there to give life and to generate with that electricity of the movement, where then God speaks and God creates. And as we walk through Genesis 1 as a church, we were reminded that God creates a space and then God fills a space. And in our own lives, we can look and we can realize the places that God has created for us and then the places where God fills that space in co-labor partnership with us. Dry ground appears. Life springs forth. Animals enter the scene. And then humans enter the scene. That's the story of Genesis 1. But in that turn of the fall and the flood in Genesis 7, we go from creation to uncreation. And I want you to notice the rhythm and rhyme that has been distorted. Where humans were the last to enter the scene in creation. In the flood, they're now the first to leave the scene. Where animals had entered the scene, they're now ready to leave. Where dry ground in life had sprung forth, now we see life extinguished in the dry ground disappearing. And where God had spoken and created and the spirit had hovered, now we see that God goes silent in the story of the flood in chapter seven. And we don't see the movement of the spirit now. We have moved from a movement of creation to uncreation. And I want us to see this story right here. And I want us to see it not just as head knowledge, not just as like an academic story of movement in like an English literary class going, oh, what an interesting movement of a literary device that God must have been doing in the scriptures. Uh, how brilliant. Let me write an essay on that. Instead, I want this to land home. And I want us to look back at that same framework of creation and uncreation. And I want us to use that as a framework for where we have seen deconstruction necessary in spaces that were hurtful and harmful, perhaps toxic and abusive, perhaps really poignant places in our own personal life where something was falling apart. A church, a system, an institution, an organization, a family structure. And maybe it was something that we contributed to, or maybe it's something that we were a victim of, an innocent bystander, one who was stuck in the middle of the road rage and the chaos. And perhaps you can use this, not just as an examine of your own life, but God has really put it on my heart this week about this church, that this is an equipping church. That as I look at the saints that are gathered in this church, that I believe God is going to equip the saints in this church for the sake of caring for and equipping the body as a whole. And so just as one year ago, we stood in the face of the insurrection at the Capitol and we named the violence and abuse of Christian nationalism and white supremacy. Let me just go back and just call it nationalism. There's, there's no Christian about it in the white supremacy and the patriarchy and the violence and the abuse. And we said, not in this house. That, that's not happening in this house. In fact, we're going to name this church as a prophetic church. And not prophetic as those people who stand on the street corner and try to offer like good things with a little bit of money to anybody who passes by. No, prophetic as in the prophets in the Old Testament who stood by the pain of the people, who voiced the pain of the people because they were near to the pain of the people. That's what it means to be prophetic. 
in the same vein as naming us one year ago as a prophetic church and still standing in the pain of that one year later as we looked at the anniversary of that this year, this week, in the same way that God is equipping us to be a prophetic church, I believe God is equipping us to care for those who have been hurt along the way by deconstruction and need somebody to walk with them in reconstruction. And perhaps this framework that I'm going to show you could be such the kind of thing you could sit with and walk with somebody as they are looking at the creation that then became uncreation in their own life. And so here's a healthy framework for flourishing. Question one, are you experiencing the dignity of humanity? In the situation, in the context, in the organization, in the family structure, in the system, I ask that question because what I'm doing is I'm taking the same framework here where creation took place and then uncreation took place and where humanity left the building at the flood first. The first question I want to ask about the system is, has humanity left the building? Have humans gone? Have animals left? Has life extinguished? Has dry ground disappeared? Has God gone silent? Where is God? Is this a place of uncreation that you're sitting in? Are you experiencing the dignity of humanity? Has humanity gone and left the building? Are people no longer kind and respectful to each other? Our humanity as a church is focused on the life, love, and justice of Jesus. And so when we talk about humanity, where is the humanity? We don't just mean being nice to each other. We mean humanity that has been embodied by a man and God named Jesus who walked and lived with dignity, love, and respect, kindness, compassion, and mutual suffering. Is that still present where you are? The humanity of Jesus. Number two is their care and concern for all creation. Just as animals boarded that boat and left and peaced out, is there still a care for all of creation? What I'm asking here is, are you concerned with something even beyond your own self? Because anyone knows to care for animals or to care for creation is to care for something beyond yourself. Is the organization, the family, the system, the structure still concerned with caring for something beyond just yourself? Do you witness a newness of life? Are good things growing? Just as life was extinguished in the uncreation, do you experience life still growing? Is this a place where good things can grow? Is this a family system or structure where good things can grow? Is the stability and security of solid ground present? My daughter, Simone, she loves to flip and cartwheel and move all over the house and break things off the wall because she's constantly moving. But she's constantly moving because somehow in this life she has trusted in the stability and security of solid ground. She knows that she can risk and explore and play and move her body every which way because at the end of the day there is solid ground. And not just on the ground around her, but also in the people around her. When we lose the security of solid ground, we no longer play. We no longer risk. We no longer move. We no longer explore. We no longer try new things. Has solid ground gone? Number five, are you able to hear from God? As the spirit had grown silent, as the presence of God seemed to depart, are you able to still hear from God in that space? Do you sense the presence and fruit of the Spirit? I don't care what Bible study they're doing. I don't care what Bible verses somebody's quoting. Is there still fruit of the Spirit? Is there love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? Do you sense the presence of the Spirit? We as a church say we want to be moved by the Spirit to follow the life, love, and justice of Jesus because we believe the Jesus we follow was moved by the Spirit. 
And so I believe this is a healthy framework for you to hold on to, to examine in your own life, but also to offer to others along the way. In that same vein of creation and uncreation, in the same way that everything began to fall apart, to walk through these pieces and to go, yeah, yeah, I know where I am in the story. And I know what's missing. And in the same opportunity and invitation for us to examine our own church, familia, always. We better be a church where we are all experiencing the dignity of humanity. We better be a church where there is concern and care for all creation. We better be a church familia that witnesses a newness of life where good things are growing, where there is stability and security. And Glendar is doing cartwheels because she trusts the ground that we're standing on allows the opportunity to play. We better be a church that where all of us can hear from God where no one's suffocated, no one is silenced, and we sense the presence and fruit of the Spirit. This movement of creation, this movement of uncreation. If you find yourself in those kinds of places, it can feel certainly like the story's over. But the word of today is remember. God remembered Noah in chapter 8. God turned the page and started a new chapter. God remembered Noah. That which had been dismembered, God remembered. And all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God sent a wind, a wind that had been absent for so long, and not just any wind, a Ruach, Holy Spirit wind, that was present from the very beginning in Genesis 1. Ain't God good, y'all. The wind is back. The Spirit is back. The movement of God is back. The breath of God is back. God remembers and God sends that wind once again. And so the creation and commissioning and falling and filling and culminating and hoping and all the uncreation that took place, God now does the rework. God recreates. God recreates as God remembers Noah. The land appears again. There's this movement of 40 days and then a holy seventh days. And then there's a surface of dry ground where people can explore and play again. There's this movement of God speaking. We haven't heard God speak in so long, but just as God spoke in Genesis 1, God is here again. God brings out the animals, the care for creation, and all the creatures move along the ground one kind after another. These echoes that go all the way back to chapter 1. This is the work that God is doing once more. And then there's a recommissioning, the recommissioning that took place, the recommissioning where God had originally told them to be fruitful and to multiply. We now see God doing that work again, be fruitful and increase. Don't just go as you are, but now move again. God reaffirms that stewardship calling. God affirms the value of life. God again tells them to be fruitful and multiply, and God establishes a Noahic covenant calls the people into a holy, beautiful, and good promise. This is the rework that God is doing. But there will also be a rework that we do in our brokenness. We fall again. There's this weird, strange, off-broken story there in chapter 9. Noah and his sons and this language of fruit and nakedness and sexual innuendo where it seems that the sin is present just as the sin was present in chapter three and then in chapter four. (sighs) We have fallen again. And that fallenness spreads like a poison as that poison spreads to the ends of the earth once more. The world is filled with sin and it re-culminates in God looking at the world And what God sees is our pride, that we may make a name for ourselves. That story of the Tower of Babel that is all about us and us trying to be our own God in the same way that in chapter 3, that power was not to follow God, but to try to become God. The disobedience, the lack of fellowship, 
this not settling, not filling the earth. God's faithfulness, God scatters them. He tears down the Tower of Babel. He tears down that whole movement of trying to climb our own way to God in the same way that he moves Adam and Eve out of the garden where he scatters them, where God scatters and moves them away so that they would not be left to their own sin forever all by themselves. God is faithful. And in God's faithfulness, God re-hopes. In the same way that God remembered Noah, God now remembers again. Chapter 12, the starting of a new chapter in a new story, this time with a man named Abram. The Lord says, God speaks again. And notice the burden of who will do the movement in this promise. God says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you because of the work that I am doing. And then at the very end of that, it just says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him to do. Look at the burden of all God is doing and the remembering. And then our part is to go and do as God had told us to do. The burden of keeping the promise, the burden of remembering is on the faithfulness of God. God remembers church. And so we must remember church. It is God who remembers us, God who makes us, God who blesses us, God who guides us, God who re-hopes in us and through us again and anew over and over and over and over. It is the story of God that is remembering and reminding and calling. God remembered Noah. God remembered Angie, God remembered Pastora Inez, God remembers Grace and Eon and Christian and John. It is this God who remembers us in our life as we live right now and in our stories that we came to today. I'm so appreciated this part from last week. As Sarah Dornboss was leading us into that rhythm of recollecting where God's presence is, the what our part to play is in that story. And Sarah said, we can trust Jesus to do for us, but we have not been able to do for ourselves." If you look at this story, it's very clear that there is a lot we can't do for ourselves. We are prone to wonder, Lord, and we feel it. But God says, but I remember you. And so you can trust Jesus to do for you what you're not able to do for yourself. And that can give us hope. Hope may not always be the loudest word in the story, but hope is the last word. And God will hope and God will re-hope as God remembers and reminds us. In fact, even in our darkest moments, we can see the story that God was writing all along the way. Not just the story of a boy standing in the center of a room, but the story of a young man going back to preach at the church that had raised him up. And he finds himself in a really dark, hard, taxing, brutal season of ministry where he's not able to be his full self. And where every time he climbs into the pulpit, he has to think about every possible word he's saying because how it's going to offend or disturb somebody who doesn't like the way that he's advocating for the life, love, and justice of Jesus in that setting. And in my memory, I can look back at that season at our former church, and I can feel small and off to the sideline and introverted and introspective and not really knowing if my full self was ever present, but then I'll stumble across a picture. And I'll go, no, the light of God was on you, son. 
You were doing the work that God had called you to do in that moment. Let me show you again how I was using you. And let me show you how I remember and re-hope. I don't just leave you in that space, but I'm the God who leads you to a spacious space. I'm the God who then takes that little boy with his hand reached out and I put you in a place among a beloved community, moved by the Spirit to follow the life, love, and justice of Jesus, not on your own, but together in comunidad with the beloved familia. I invite you this week, go look at some pictures. Go look at the remembering that God has done in your own life. Go look for the light in the photos that you don't remember were present and let Christ show you a no, show you a new, how God was carrying you through all along the way. I invite Angie to lead us in a song of response and then Pastora Inez will lead us in community as we come to the communion table together. Thank you, Angie, for leading us so well and pastoring our hearts. 
And thank you, Pastor Bobby, for a beautiful framework. I love those questions that you ask. What is a framework for flourishing? We could just keep adding to that more and more and more. So thank you for laying that down. It is causing us to ponder. It is causing us to return. It is causing us to remember and to anticipate recreation. There's so, so much that I wrote down. I love how you all in the chat, as well as in my heart, I see how God is always inviting us to the places where we've been to before. So even as we come to the table of communion, when you said, Pastor Bobby, uh, go back and look at some pictures. Pictures are powerful, aren't they? They have memory and emotion connected to them. And I don't know if you meant that for, to be part of your sermon, but to go back and look at pictures is a powerful thing. God is always inviting us to go back to the places where we have been. And another thing that I, that I heard as I was listening to Claudia Wright as well and Melika and Sarah is that our creation and our recreation is ongoing. Our recreation is ongoing. And so we're not just entering this dead text of the Old and New Testament. We're entering back into our story. And our story is engaging with those texts that for many of us have been used and weaponized against us, not just history, but God's story and also ourselves. And so I pray that we all together in comunidad, we will do the work of healing because the work of healing will determine the work of our hoping. And God's creation of us is always ongoing. So as we come to the table, to remember that word carries so much weight in this church. And I love all that you said, uh, Melika and Sarah as well. As we remember and are remembering the things that have happened to us, and as we remember the work of Christ, and as we're being remembered and re-ligamented together, it is a hard work. It is holy work. It is vulnerable work. I invite you to be gentle with your body to be gentle with what your body is carrying, has carried, and will continue to carry. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the tortilla of the Lord, tomó pan y dio gracias, y lo partió diciendo, este es mi cuerpo, mi cuerpo que fue violentado por cada uno y cada una de ustedes. This is my body who took all the violence that it could on your behalf. We come to a body and we come to a bread that is well acquainted with our suffering, all sources of suffering. So when we come to the table, as a comunidad, we come tenderly, we come slowly, we come gently. Y damos gracias and we say, God, thank you. Thank you for a Jesus that understands Damos gracias y decimos, este es el cuerpo de Cristo. Y también, este es el cuerpo de Cristo. La comunidad and the church familia is also the body of Christ. Take and eat. And after supper, with his amigos and amigas, his best friends, some who were going to betray him, tomó la copa, Y dijo, este es el pacto en mi sangre. Hagan esto en memoria de mí. Do this in remembrance of me as you're being remembered and re-ligamented together. Hasta que el Señor venga. Señor y Padre Celestial, te damos gracias por este tiempo. God, we thank you for the act of remembering and going back to and as Sarah told us, not to return to the same, as you're reminding us and remembering us and inviting us gently to go back to our stories and to go back to the sacred story and to go back to the story that you're creating now. We're not returning back to the same places where we have been. And we hope, God, we have great hope that you're putting the pieces back together, like Sarah said, not in the same way that they were before, but like a broken bone heals and is always put back together stronger than the original bone, God, we ask that you would do. The burden is on you to remember us and re-ligament us. The burden is on you, Holy Spirit, to put us back together stronger than we were before. 
in our individual stories, and also as a comunidad that is walking together in pilgrimage, walking towards you, Jesus, housing the presence of Jesus. So God, have your way in us and put us back together, stronger than we were before, more gentle than we were before, more courageous than we were before. Show us again, like Pastor Bobby says, and show us anew. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, amen y amen.